All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Another World Audiobooks. I'm here today, actually, with a guest, which is uh, amazingly, Matt. This is, the, this is the first time there's been a guest on this podcast. So, yeah, I don't know if that's an honor or a privilege or, or not, but uh, whatever it is, you have it. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is exciting. <laughs> this is fun. I love doing these. Yeah, yeah, I'm stoked to see. Like I said, this is the first time we're doing it, so just to kind of explore a bit of the the writing side of things. Um, as far as uh, a lot of people know me as like an audiobook narrator, but I also do some writing on the side, so it's just kind of natural to connect with other authors that are out there doing that and stuff. So, uh, you uh, as a listeners, you probably uh, recognize the name Matt Brown from an indie author spotlight. That uh, man, we did that. That was back in like May, maybe. I, I think maybe it was June? May, May or June, yeah. maybe. But, yeah, uh, something like that. And, uh, so and yeah, I still that... have to give you props for for the the trailer, man. I oh. cry. <laughs> I, I honestly cried, like when I saw that trailer and I heard the narration. <laughs> I was like, I got goosebumps. And then I ran. <laughs> I literally ran to my boss at work. And I showed it to her, and I was like, "You got to see this! You got to see this!" And she's like, "What? What? What are you talking about?" And so I showed it to her, and uh, I watched as as I pl- I gave her my head, my earbuds, and um, uh-huh. I she just sat there and she was just frozen. And then I watched the goosebumps get on her on on her arms, and I was like, "Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you know you're doing something right." Oh, oh that's not- awesome. Not just me, but the guy doing the reading. I mean, it was <laughs> it was incredible. It it was exactly the way I'd hoped to hear it. I mean, oh, I, man. there's no better there's no better compliment, I think, as a writer than when you meet somebody who can take what you write and just give it some sort of life that just and, and the feeling too. I mean, it was yeah. just. Because I've showed it to dozens of people, not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't mind at all. That's, yeah, as as a narrator, I can't tell you how much that means to me just to know that as the author. Because you you got something in your mind, right? When you, any anybody who writes, they know that as you write, you have something pictured in your mind. And, and I bet um, it, anybody who's an audiobook listener has probably run into that where at some point they've listened to like, you know, maybe it's their favorite book and they listen to it and the narrator's just horrible and they're like oh no like you just completely ruined the book for me so uh hearing from an author that they liked it like that that's about the biggest compliment i could get so well, i mean you did you did an amazing job man i have to give you props so i well, mean and that's something but, that authors are really looking for is someone who can really give life to the story in a new way and it's it's something that i really believe that as a writer you know you you really have to be passionate about what you're doing and yeah. you may have lulls and dull moments. I've had plenty, trust me. Oh Lord. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, when you love what you do, it takes on a life of its own. It just becomes like breathing. You can't survive yeah. without it. You know, um, mm-hmm. there's a guy, I listened to some of his, 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 uh, YouTube videos. His name's, uh, Eric Thomas, you know, and, uh, I hope I quote him right. I'm trying to remember how. If you, if you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you'd be successful. So if you're mm. really hungry for what you want to do with your life, and for me, it's writing. I just, you know, it, it's it's my passion, and and yeah. I'm still learning. You know, I'm not I'm not Stephen King or any of those <laughs> big guys. You know, my my writing's always evolving. I'm always learning, and yeah. I think. Part of writing is having the humility to say, I don't know everything and I'm still learning and I'm still going to change through this process because just like you grow in life, you grow in whatever talent or art that you're doing and you never really arrive. You're always on this journey of, Mm -hmm. you know, well, I just learned something new today or a couple weeks ago when I went to writers conference you know, meeting different people and meet and talking with different authors about where they're at, what stages that they're at and being able to help them or just learn about what they do and where they come from. You know, I'm like one of the authors here is a biologist, like certified professor. And that was so cool. So when I talked about, well, I scientifically explained how dragons breathe fire and all this other stuff. She was like, (laughs) stared at me for a minute and she's like, okay, I have to hear this. So I went to the whole explanation 
And yeah, it's maybe it's a little bit of pseudoscience, but when I explain the process that I used to, you know, deduce, well, maybe this is a plausible way. And then I got to talk to a biologist about it and the biologist looking at me like, that's awesome, you know, because all I did was look at biology of different animals and figure out a way that this could plausibly be feasible under the right circumstances and conditions. Well, and, let's take a step back here because um, you're getting into dragons and you're getting into sorry, writers' conferences. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're just feeling comfortable and opening up. But I want to take a step back just for people who have no idea who you are and like, who's this guy? And where's my audio book? Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say people go back in the in the backlist of Another World Audiobooks, and there's an indie author spotlight. We've done probably close to a dozen of them by now, but Matt was actually one of the first ones that I did way back in May, I think it was this year. So go back and check out that. It's called Valkyrie, and you get a little sneak peek, sneak peek of the of the book, and it is awesome. And you're still in the process of writing that, but let's let's just jump back, get to know you a little bit as an author. So Matt Brown is uh, your name, and you, tell us just a little bit about where where you're from uh, and how you got started on this writing journey. Well, I've always been like a daydreamer. Like, um, I grew up in Florida in, uh, near St. Augustine, small town called Palatka. If you know where that's at, you have absolutely impressed me because it, <laughs> and, and I was told this as a kid, so I have no factual basis on this, but what I was told at the, as a kid was the name of my hometown means crappy town on the river. <laughs> <laughs> If it's true, well, okay. If it's not, then well, uh, you know, you know how things you get told as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Gets the but, point across. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, it's really not a bad place. I mean, I had I have a lot of good memories there, and there's a lot of good people that live there. So this is not mm. bash on hometown segment. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I've always been really creative, and. Um, where my brother was the more outdoorsy type. I mean, I, I do enjoy the outdoors and I did enjoy camping with my family and stuff. I was more of the guy that I would see something and I can make a story out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, like some of my toys, I and I've mentioned this on Twitter a couple times as a joke and laugh with a few people about it. I used to freeze my toys in blocks of ice <laughs> and pretend that they were cryogenically frozen. Whoa. So that my other toys would find them, and then I would take an ice pick, and I'd slowly thaw them out or, <laughs> or, or chip it away and then thaw them out and say, hey, you know, hey, guys, we discovered this new race or something or other. And, nice. Or, and, yeah, my, my mom would always ask me, why are you using my cups for this? <laughs> <laughs> or I would nice. take strips of toilet paper and wet it down, and it's surprising how well wet toilet paper makes um, mummy bandages when you tear oh, it into you strips. Yeah. So I, I I did crazy stuff like that as a kid. So but. always just imagining things and picturing stuff. So that was kind of your, your growing up years in Florida. Were, were you into writing at all at that point, or was it just uh, just making it was up stories and just making up stories and being a kid, being playing video games, yeah. you know, just okay. doing that kind of thing. But a lot of that I think fed my imagination. You know, a mm. lot of it was like like when Nintendo. Yeah, I just dated myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I was gonna ask like what 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 were the the video games that were your your go-tos there. Well, I mean, Nintendo, you know, obviously Super Mario Brothers, but then I discovered mm. robots through uh, the game series Mega Man. Um, oh, and okay. that was just like, you mean I can absorb other things' powers and go blow them up too? Yes. <laughs> Hard to beat that. So, you know, but then it just expanded like Castlevania, you know, role-playing games, stuff that challenged my brain, made me think. Yeah made me analyze, look at things differently, you know, family time growing up watching the Stargate series with my dad and, and, uh, and it's hard to believe that that series has been around for as long as it has now, but, <laughs> or Star yeah. Trek or things like that, or just playing pool and looking at, it's just, it's always been, you know, I've always had different influences, either reading wise. Um, my dad was a big, big on learning how to read. It just wasn't my uh. brother's thing, you know? Because my brother was the outdoorsy, you know, he was the active type, always going out and doing stuff. And I was just more indoors, you know. I was always yeah, um, reading or doing something. Like, I got to the point to where I could finish a 300-page book in just a few hours, you know, like oh, three wow. or four hours. And um, <clears throat> way later on down the road when I got turned on to one of the Star Wars series, which is 19 books, I read it in two weeks. 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I think calling you an avid reader would be an understatement at this point. Well, I've read whatever I could get my hands on. And then when I got introduced yeah. to mythology, uh, my parents were a little worried because <laughs> yeah. I would bring home books on vampires, werewolves, monsters, myths, whatever yeah. I could get my hands on. I would be going to the library. I mean, like in first grade, I was reading about dinosaurs and, and I grabbing mm-hmm. every book I could about the dinosaurs and what period they existed in and, and pronouncing words way bigger than someone my age should have been able to. But um, nice. You know, but all of that sort of fed into my desire to create something. And then yeah, in high school, I was introduced to Dungeons and Dragons, and then that was it. Mm-hmm. Um, I started taking notes and doing things, and I never really took the writing serious until, was it maybe 2006, I think? So it's it's been okay. a very long process. I mean, yeah. when I was in high school, I actually did start writing a, a book, and it was horrible. <laughs> I, I'm willing to admit how absolutely horrible. Oh, my computer just went to sleep mode. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, I but, think that's but, a, that's an important lesson for people who are listening. And, and I'm assuming if you're listening to this podcast, you're the type of person who who likes writing and likes books and authors and all that sort of thing. So if if, if becoming an author is ever something that anyone listening is interested in pursuing, that's that's an important lesson because. Um, I was actually just listening to something else. They were talking about how um, anytime you start a job, you don't consider yourself to be good at it the first year that you're working there. But then it's like people start being an author and they're like, oh, it's not perfect. And it's not exactly what I want it to be. So, you know, screw it. I'm, I'm done with it. And it's like, yeah, you got to you got to push through that first horrible book. <laughs> well, I mean, reflecting, it was horrible. But to a young, impressionable teenager, it was the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> ah, there you go. You know, well, I was like, I thought I was being so clever <laughs> and so ingenious, but really, yeah. you know, I was just taking things that I'd seen and, and turning them into my own story. That's what a lot of people mm-hmm. do anyway. But yeah, um, it, it's stepping stones and building blocks. And, and those things are important. You know, it's like... Yeah it's all a process. And when I've actually got serious and a friend of mine was looking through all my notes about the world that I created, which totally doesn't have the same name as it does now, even though it's the same world. Hmm. Um, it's evolved. It, every, well, all of that's evolved way yeah. more than it has when I, <clears throat> sorry, it's ranting. Um, I get excited. <laughs> no, but, no, I'm loving it. Um, the thing is like when my friend looked at it, um, uh, back in 2006, I think it was 2006. Um, he was like, what are you doing with this? I said, well, I'm running D and D games. He says, no, you're not. And I was like, well, what am I supposed to do? You should write a story. You should write a book. Uh-huh. I said, well, should I, what should I write about? I said, well, write about our D and D campaign. It worked for other people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the yeah. Dragonlance novels, Ed Greenwood, you know, all those guys and all the D and D novels. I mean, they're there for a reason, you know, and people love them. Wow. So, yeah. uh, the Pathfinder books yeah. by the guys written by Paizo. Um, some of the books Chris Jackson has written, um, who's another really awesome guy you guys should check out. Um, Hmm. um, but, uh, you know, he got me thinking. So the first two serious books I wrote were based off a D&D campaign I ran and I was all proud of it. And I was like, well, I'll just go write for the same people that do this, you know, because it's what I love. And, and, uh, that was my first rejection letter, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's when you know you're an author. Yeah, but the the <laughs> thing about it was it it gave me pause because I was like I was so excited I didn't understand anything about the business, yeah. you know, and I think because of that rejection, I think it's what really got me thinking about where am I going with this? Because well, my friends, you know, and I have some really harsh critiques for friends you know they will they will tell you if it's crap and they will not pull punches (laughs) so which is good you need people like that um oh definitely but um it gave me a chance to really rethink what i was doing and really appreciate like you know this could actually be a good thing i mean and initially when someone tells you no you get all sad and depressed because this human behavior is normal but like it just really okay. So what am I, what kind of story am I really trying to tell? Because I had already had so many characters, 
So I hmm. decided with the main series that I'm actually trying to submit, and I'm actually going through a refinement process with it right now. Um, oh, it, wow. <clears throat> um, I pulled some characters from that those two books, and I was like, what's their deal? You know, and they they have a history because I already established that in these two books, which then I got to thinking, well, well, let me, let me think on this a little bit more. And then before I knew it, it really felt like it was becoming more of a serious thing for me. Cause then I started okay. doing some research and I started reading and then I started, I created a whole language for the elves out of that. And then I created, Oh my goodness. Uh, I started looking at the culture, how they lived. Um, what like there's all these important things that in my rush to like i mean i enjoyed the process of writing the book i had fun but then there were details that was like well this doesn't make sense hmm. and this detail doesn't make sense and then i just started connecting the dots and then i was like i really need to take some time to work on this and from that that's when uh, Alanthar started really, which I may still change that name if because I think a publisher will probably make me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but that's when the world of Alanthar really started becoming something more. And wow. then I I started really analyzing. <clears throat> I got serious about a world map, and I really started analyzing locations and places and what was there. I, that was the biggest question: was what's there? Why is it there? Yeah. How did this get started? You know. And then my whole creation story came into being. And then, you know, and a lot of that was through writing the Ancient Blood series that I'm, that's my main focus. You know, it's my, um, I really started learning more about the world. And um, I, I would actually joke with people because I kind of felt, and I say this respectfully, I kind of felt a little bit like Tolkien when C.S. Lewis would tease him about stop with the damn elves. Because <laughs> that was uh um, from what I've read, that was a coined phrase by uh, C.S. Lewis whenever him and Tolkien <laughs> would talk about uh, yeah. Lord of the Rings. You know, he was like, Tolkien, quit with the damn elves. Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's really where I started was, you know, the, the kingdom of Deschel and the Shadow Wood and the Shaylin and who they were and hmm. where they got to this point, you know, and um, unintentionally how, like, racial issues came up. Um that's one of the big things in in ancient blood from in the main series is <clears throat> whenever i write something it's like my intent is never to be political about it cuz i just i only write what the story tells me to and that sounds kind yeah. of strange but it's like you'll know when you're as you grow as a writer and as you start working on things you'll really i feel like you'll really start having a feel for doing what the story tells you to because if you do what you want to do, it's not going to be as good. Um, it is incredible to me. I because um, I'm very much a plot person. Like I am focused on you know planning it out and making sure there's all kinds of twists and stuff like that. And then um, I kind of got challenged to do NaNoWriMo this year, and I was just like, um, there is no way that I can continue writing. Um, as far as, cause I was doing like a, a fantasy novel. I was a, actually my a second one. And, uh, that was my plan to do that for NaNoWriMo. But I was like, there's no way I can meet a, a, a daily word count if I'm planning and plotting like I always do. So I decided to go a different direction and actually do more of what you're talking about and actually take it in the, in the area of just like following the story and just being like, okay, what happens next? And kind of figuring it out. And it, it does, it sounds really weird when you put it like that. People are like, what do you mean? Like you're the one writing, but there's been several times, uh, even just this, this last 12 days of NaNoWriMo that I've been like, okay, what, what happens next? And then I have to just figure it out like oh that's what happens next and just kind of it's amazing how it just kind of comes out of you after a while yeah i mean it just it's i often make the joke and i've made the joke on twitter um <clears throat> that the characters in your book are high paid actors who end up telling you what to do even though you're supposed to be the director <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's just the, bo the bossy people yeah i mean and they will go on strike <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. They, if their demands aren't met they will hold you hostage <laughs> speaking of twitter i should say at matt brown zero one two and that's matt with one t so we'll put the links down below as well you definitely want to go follow matt he, you do a lot of the uh the very short fiction stuff there on twitter which is is really interesting what, what kind of got you into that well i got to thinking about 
I'm, I mean, one of the things as a writer is um, you, you get told you got to figure out what your brand is, and that's something that I'm still trying to sort of learn. Because, I mean, there's a lot of more things with marketing as a writer, either whether you go traditional or independent, and I'm still on the fence about which way I'm going to go with some of the stuff I'm working on. Um, mm. <clears throat> I definitely think I want to do Ancient Blood traditionally. But I think to do exposure, I think I'm going to do Valkyrie as independent, um, just to have a book to kind of show, you know, something about me, you know, something more yeah. in depth than a simple short story on my blog or my, Let, my thoughts. Let's take about a life. step back here with the so you've you've mentioned Ancient Blood. I, we we talked about Valkyrie a little bit. Just give people like the thirty thousand foot view of Matt Brown, author, because I I guess I didn't realize that you had. I thought for some reason. I didn't look very deeply, apparently, that uh, Valkyrie was your, your first one. So what, what what's the whole, like, give, you the, give us the overarching look of what the, the books you've written and are planning on writing. Okay. Um, so, well, first I'll finish the, the, the answering the question about the short story stuff. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. It's, it's cool. Um, the short stories on Twitter are sort of like a way to help me flush out ideas. Hmm. Um. And they're kind of fun. It's it's sometimes I can't think of something that fits with what I'm envisioning with the, the prompts. So I'll use micro. I've started using micro story, um, which I've seen a lot of people do. So I don't know if that's proper etiquette or not. Um, I just kind of I just love to write stories. So I if I think of a character or I think of an idea, or if I have a really good short story in mind that I'm working on, like uh, the bargain, which I put on my website, on my blog, um, I'll do teasers. I'll give you hints of characters or hints of things that I might be working on. Okay. You know, backstories or something, and then I'll take bits of that information, and then I'll I'll either <clears throat> throw it into the short story, or it'll give you some more depth of what's going on with the characters on a side on a side thing, so people who are following me could try to connect the dots. It's sort of, sort of fun Easter eggs. Um, nice. You know, because I I just. I think with that stuff, I really want to make it. And like I said, I'm not perfect. I will make mistakes writing things, you know, and I'm sure people will call me out for it, which is fine. Um, <laughs> but I really, the internet think, is good at that. Oh, sheesh. yeah. That's, that's a, that's a whole nother <laughs> conversation. We don't need to go yeah, into right it. There. <laughs> um, but for me, it's about the readers. You know, I never, I want to do my very best never to insult anyone who comes to like what I do. Um, hmm. And so, I try to think of fun ways to really hook the readers into seeing, you know, I, I want to tell stories and I want to tell stories that are interesting enough to keep you paying attention, you know, something that you can cherish and enjoy. Um, going into the question about like all the stuff that I've written. So um, the first two books I ever wrote, not counting the one in high school, which I lost. I don't even know what I did with that. I actually wrote it by hand. <laughs> oh man! And wow, I think I made it to a hundred right pages of notebook paper before I lost it because you know high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the first two books I ever wrote, um, I really still, I still don't really have good titles for them. But they were, they were sort of what got me seriously started because that's what my friend had said. You know, hey, you should do something with this. So I tried doing it through a D and D campaign. And um, I think it might still have potential, but it needs so many revisions. Like, Lord. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but then from that, that's where the Ancient Blood series came from. And I spent a long time world building and working on it. So between, I want to say 2008 to a year and a half ago, I, I got to book three. Um which I started book three this year, but it's slow because um, book three in the series is much different from the other two. It's one of those novels that if you don't walk the line very carefully, your readers won't pick the book back up. And so I have to make yeah. sure that between both books and the plot and the development, that it all really makes sense. You know, um, I'm doing some kind of bold things in the sense that um, I'm not sure really how to how to put that, but it's 
it's definitely different. I have a friend who warns me all the time. He says, you need to be really careful about this subject and this subject and this subject. Because, again, mm. I'm not here to write political stuff. I don't want to. I don't want to go that route. That's, yeah. That's – well, think, we're so we're so inundated with it, like <clears throat> almost without our our dis- even choosing to be inundated with it. That when we go to fantasy and and fiction stuff, like that's not what people are looking for. I think most of the time. No, I mean they're looking for a way out. They don't want to. They get yeah. bombarded with you know, you're not sure who to believe, what, where, when, or why, and some people just want a good story. You know, um, yeah. I think in in the last couple. I guess, yeah, about last two and a half years, Joseph Campbell's become a really big influence on me. Um, hmm. And if, if you guys who are listening aren't familiar with him, uh, Joseph Campbell wrote the whole thing about the hero's journey. And yeah. the hero's journey is huge. It's it's this whole pie chart, this whole wheel of where the hero starts as a nobody and then is elevated to a somebody. Because he goes through a series of trials along the way that challenge challenges his, in some ways his faith, some ways his character, some ways his his moral compass, his well, moral compass and character, same thing. But, um, you know, there are challenges throughout the entire journey, and you don't have to use every as a writer, you don't have to use every single part of the wheel. You can only you only have to use what's really relevant to your story. But I think it's a really powerful, compelling formula that's been successful for since people were telling stories. Um, a mm-hmm. lot of the ancient myths follow the hero's journey in some yeah. form or fashion, you know, any ancient story and even a lot of stories today follow that whole wheel. And you never really realize you're using the formula as a writer until you take a look at it. And then you're like, Oh wow. You know, especially if you're a fantasy writer, because it really hits home because a lot of the myths were so fantastical in their natures you know um yeah and so as i've i've as i've worked on this series i've i've really started being able to relate to the impact and the especially the emotional impact that that whole formula has had on my writing and Hmm. um i think i think that's what helps it be that i think that's what helps challenge me is making sure i stay on point that way I think I answered that question. Okay. Um, and then yeah. Valkyrie was a side project that uh, I think about five or six years ago, I had this idea of a redemption story. But it couldn't mm-hmm. just be any redemption story. It had to be specific. It had to be a female hero. Had to be. It wouldn't have made sense any other way. Um, yeah. Who steps into a role that she was never, you know, she had never been equipped to do. And then is transformed into somebody she has never been before, you know? And it's kind of like mm. a friend of mine who passed away a few years ago used to say that in order to become someone you've never been, you got to be willing to do things you've never done. And, yeah. um, I think for Iadra, her start of her hero's journey is that moment. She decides that to take a step in a different direction and it dramatically changes the rest of her life. And you see this theme of different people being challenged either to be redeemed or changed in some way as a result of their interactions with her and the whole story arc and as it develops. And it's just yeah. that kind of story that just seemed to jump out at me. And so when I got to looking at, well, I need to back off from book three and really think about where I'm going with book three carefully. Hmm. I wanted to have something else because I didn't want to just not write something. And I thought, well, maybe it's time I started working on Valkyrie for a little bit. And okay. since January, that's just what I've been doing. And then I'll write maybe a few, a chapter or I'll, I'll review what I've written in book three to make sure it's on track. And then I'll get a new idea and I'll jot it down in my notes and then I'll go back to Valkyrie. That's awesome. Um, or if I get a so short story. For- I'll do that. For, for those people who are, are listening, uh, definitely go check out it, uh, a writer's thoughts.com, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's where you can. So I give you the, the audio sample here on the podcast of Valkyrie, but you can check out what is it through? You're almost at chapter 50, aren't you? Uh, yes. I'll have to go look at getting close. Looking, close. Um, and it's, yeah. it is a, it is a work in progress. Um, one of the things I look forward to most is going back through and doing the edits. And I know that's insane for a writer to say, but I actually like editing. (laughs) (laughs) 
I like that it because insane, I yeah. get to I get to analyze what's going on and like did I did I miss the mark or did I hit the mark? You know, did yeah. did I go off and left field somewhere? Because often when you're writing the first draft, it's going to be crap. Um, yeah, the first so draft is that. always crap, but um, that's where editing gives you the opportunity to sort of enrich it. You know, to to till the ground, to find the mistakes, to find the things so you, that were maybe not quite right. But enable you to take a bad story, even though it may be a good bad story, to make it an amazing story. And then as you go through it a few more times, you know, it's you always it's always amazed me. Like I've been through as I created uh Alanthar, I um I've revised Ancient Blood about fourteen times and rewritten it three times. Oh wow. Um Last year, when I finally sat down to really work through stuff after going to a writing conference, I finished both books in seven months. I went back and redid both books in seven months. Um, wow! I I just was like, I I have what I I know where I'm going, and not that I didn't know yeah. where I was going before, but it's more clarity. Yeah, the clarity was just like spot on. After a mm. friend of mine read through book one. Um, and kind of gave me a, a, a swift kick in the pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. I, I was like, you know what? Okay. And, um, it was a very encouraging conversation. And then from then I was just lit. So I would go to work yeah. and I would work eight hours and then I would go to my office at Subway, um, which I call Subway my office. Everybody knows me by name. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just sit down and I write. Um, and, and, um, so for those seven months I was, I was putting in almost 16 hours between work and writing. Wow. Um, and wow. that's, that was my life. And, uh, I, I occasionally on my off days, I probably wouldn't do anything, but, um, you know, it was just, it just, the story just kind of, I couldn't let it go. You know, I had that fire Yeah. and um, it's just, I don't know. There's just something about it when you, like I said before, when you really love something, just pursue it, just go after it. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love it. I think that's, it's exactly what, um, how I feel about writing and stuff like that. It's like there, yeah. Cause as so many people, um, when I kind of started my writing journey, um, I was told repeatedly by very well-meaning people, that like starving author, like that's, that's how it works as you cannot change that. You cannot be a writer for, you know, uh, make a living being a writer. You, you just can't. And, um, I, I think as far as on the fiction side, um, that definitely hasn't, hasn't, uh, or I haven't made any money on the fiction side yet. <laughs> We're still working in that direction, but, uh, it's, it, you, it doesn't, it shouldn't stop you from taking that step. Um, just because somebody says, uh, things are one way or another, yeah, like you gotta you gotta push for it if it's something that you actually want. Yeah, do you think it's worthwhile? Like, there's an author I met uh, when I went to Gen Con when I was first really getting started. Um, because I won't don't know all the details of his entire journey, I'm not going to use any names. But um, uh, he's been a huge inspiration because mm. where my I've I've watched sort of what I can. Uh, of his journey and he started off like you know the working guy you know and deciding well this is what I want to do and he wrote his first novel and then he wrote a couple of more novels and then he he started networking and now 12 years later he's writing he he's making his living off his writing mm. you know yes <laughs> and the thing about it is That's watching awesome. his journey you know is it's just been so inspiring because he's the nicest guy you'll ever meet um, yeah. When I talked to him, and I'm so glad that I didn't take him up on his offer because the book was in much need of work. Um, <laughs> but when I spoke to him uh, at Gen Con, uh, and I got to get to know him, and then I got to know his publisher uh, because they had a panel, and I, I'd seen and I'd been doing some research, and um, I, I got to thinking after I get back got back from Gen Con, I was like. Well, they do referrals. Why don't I just send them an email? Mm -hmm. 
I didn't yeah. expect anything from it. the guy. The guy was like, "Sure, I'll do a referral. Send me your book. If it's good enough, I'll send it on." Oh wow! I was like, "What?" <laughs> and then me and my ex broke up at the time. Oh, and so priorities kind of threw things for a loop. Yeah, priorities got shifted, and um, yeah. So, but you know, life happens. But sometimes life happens in a way that needed to happen, so you can be better prepared for the journey ahead. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I feel like had I sent my book in then, I wouldn't have been nearly as prepared as I am now, 12 years later. Hmm. And I think yeah. that's something really important is um, all my experiences have taught me that now don't be in a rush to get – I mean obviously pursue what you want, but don't be in a rush to get there too quickly because you may not be ready for what comes and – if you're not ready for what comes, then it's going to be that much harder to find the success that you're really striving for. Yeah. Yeah. Now I was, I was just listening to something uh, the other day and they were talking about how uh, we, we talk about patience and I think people mean a couple different things by it, but what, what you shouldn't mean by patience is just sit around and hope something happens to you. Right. Um, that you should be, you should be patient knowing that it's going to take a lot of hard work and it's going to take a lot of, action right now in order to get where you want to go but that doesn't that shouldn't stop you from acting and and taking the first steps to to make something happen mm -hmm. Def definitely and yeah and you know some of that especially as a writer is just networking um oh yeah getting to know people like me getting to know you and then when i meet people who are interested in audiobooks and i try to say well hey i know this guy you know uh -huh. um that's just part of that or if if not if, but when, well, of course, when sounds arrogant, but you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> when, when I finally get to that point to where I'm, I'm published and I'm there, um, I want to be able to, to pay it forward. Like what was done for like the opportunity yeah. that was presented for me, you know, like if I, if I know an author and they're really serious about, um, being published and they're really passionate, that's, that's the big thing for me is if they're really passionate about it and they're really sincere about it and it's not just, a, a one-off you know i will say well hey yeah. I'll, let me go talk to somebody for you um i might know somebody that might be a good fit let me let me ask them and if they say yes mm -hmm. i'll send, i'll tell them about you and you know and then see you guys can connect and we'll see what happens and if and if that works out for you then wonderful fantastic awesome um if it's not a good fit then that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you um that was something else a friend of mine told me was um if an agent or a publisher tells you no, that doesn't mean you suck. Yeah. It just means they can't help you get to where you want to go. And it's, it's a, they can't help you right now type of thing. I mean, there's, there's so much as far as timing goes, right. where I've heard stories of people where it's like, they'll talk to somebody and they're like, no, nope, that's definitely not a fit. And then you come back a year later and it's like, oh yeah, let's totally do it. So yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, that tenacity. I think that's, that's kind of always been one of the words that I try and live by is tenacity. Like you just, you keep coming after it like a bulldog and you know, you're, you're respectful and you, you uh, respect people's boundaries and stuff like that. But at the same time, if you're not willing to take no for an answer, you're, you're going to get a yes eventually. Right. So I think I, I want to just touch on this briefly. We've already been going for quite a while here, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I want to touch briefly on the, uh, the whole uh, self-publish versus actually like trying to get a publishing deal with a, with a company. Um, we, we'd actually, we talked a little bit, um, I think on Twitter messaging early on about that. And, um, I, it's, it's a big debate in the whole industry. I listen to several writing podcasts and some are on the, the like complete self-published wagon and then others are more on, you know, get, get a deal if you can type of things. Uh, how, uh, where are you kind of on that spectrum and what is your, um, thoughts as far as the, the status of the engine, uh, the, of the industry right now? I think, um, I think a lot of it's going to depend on time for me. Like, hmm. If, and this is my understanding thus far, if traditional publishing eases some of the burdens of traditional publishing, because I mean, I, I'm still working a 40 hour work week, you know, I, I still have a job yeah. and responsibilities to take care of. If it helps ease the burden so I can better manage my, my personal life, 
uh, and doesn't hurt me at my job because I mean I still have to I still have to eat I still have to make money to take care of myself. Um, <laughs> it's a darn thing about life. Yeah, huh? you know those stupid responsibilities, man. I tell you <laughs> what, it just they just soak it in we the get way. Right all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that's what really it really comes down to. If I have the time to do a lot of the promotions that self publishing is going to demand on me, or if I can find a way to better balance both then absolutely whichever benefits me the most is what I'm going to pursue. And I think that's a personal decision that everybody has to make as a writer. If you, if you have the funds, because there's a, a higher cost involved in self publishing. Um, and if you have the means to self publish and afford what it takes, then, you know, absolutely. If you think that's the better road for you, but it's, it's not necessarily about what's right or wrong. Cause I've talked with a lot of different authors about it. It's about whatever's the better road to get you to the success that you want to have. Um, yeah. but it's, it's, um, I mean, that's really, that's really the key is either traditional publishing works for you because of where you're at in life or, self-publishing works for you because of where you're at in life. It's not necessarily a right or wrong answer, but yeah. the, the thing about it is knowing if you're self-publishing, being knowledgeable enough about the business, um, the publishing part of the business, because writing isn't necessarily a business, but the publishing portion is. So you know how to reach your audiences appropriately and um, not just, you know, st- going to people because I've heard a lot of writers tell me this, please don't throw your book at me. Mm-hmm. You know, is, I mean, that's, that's not a good marketing tactic. Um, no. uh, and I'm sure you've gotten this too on Twitter where you have people who will message you and say, buy my book. Yeah. You know, it's their, among, their introduction. It's like, wow. Yeah. So that's, um, that, yeah. It's Hi, like what's a your name again? Resp- <laughs> yeah. It's like a program response. Not, Hey, how you doing? Have you had a great day today? You know, I mean, most of the time, and I'm not trying to be mean, Anyone who will send me a personal message on Twitter about come buy my book um, without just even just talking to me through normal channels, I yeah. tend to unfollow. Yeah, um, it, it makes sense. Yeah, and that, that's one of the things I just really appreciate about you. You're a you're a real guy. You're just putting stuff out there. You're sincere. You're you're passionate, and, and yeah, I just I, I love what you're doing. I really hope that um, yeah, people go and check you out. I mean, seriously, there's there's uh, there's tons of authors out there, but I, I I could see Matt Brown going places. So this is definitely one of the guys you want to keep an eye on. And just just the amount of world building you've already put in. Uh, and the amount of time and, and effort and everything, it's just, it's incredible. I don't, I don't know many people that are as dedicated to it as, as you are. So. You should read, you um, should read, yeah. uh, and this is a joke I have with my friends. You should read my 50 page thesis on magic. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, that's what I'm saying. Um, I don't know many authors who've, who've put that kind of effort in on something like which this. Which is so. also getting a revision. Yeah, <laughs> that is awesome that is awesome well matt thank you so much for your time and uh this has been a great conversation i love love doing this we'll have to i think we'll have to do it again i'd love to anytime you want to i mean i always yeah i feel like we just barely scratched the surface on on all the stuff we could talk about (laughs) yeah we're it's just just a couple of authors geeking out about author stuff yeah absolutely Awesome. Well, again, ladies and gentlemen, go check out Matt Brown 012, and that's Matt with one T on on the Twitters. And a uh, link is down below, as well as a link to his blog, which is a writersthoughts.com. And yeah, it was, he's giving away his writing. So if you enjoy fantasy, if you love this sort of thing, I mean, go go check him out. Give him some support. And uh, definitely check out the the first couple chapters of Valkyrie, which are still on the podcast. Just go back into the, uh, the archives there. And you'll find them for your listening pleasure. So, Matt, thanks for coming on. Awesome. Thank you for having me. <laughs>